Exodus chapter 30. Exodus 30. So good to see you in the house of the Lord tonight. Brother Mickey, good to always see you. We love your family. A little bit of a lengthy reading. I'm going to try to go quick. Look at verse 22 of Exodus 30. I, I really tried to scale it down, but I think it loses something if you don't uh, read it all. Exodus 30, beginning of verse 22. Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half as much, even 250 shekels, of sweet calmus, 250 shekels, and, and of cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary. Man, I don't have time. That, that's deep right there. I don't have time to preach that. And of oil, olive, and hen. Now, I looked that word, and hen, up. That means six quarts of olive oil. That's a lot of oil, people. And thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment. You cannot separate that word ointment from healing. You cannot. An ointment, a compound after the art of the apothecary, it shall be a holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all the vessels, and the candlestick, and his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels, and the laboring and his foot, and thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most Holy, whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me. See, you thought the priest was to minister unto you. The priest is to minister unto him. In the priest's office, verse 31 and 32, here it goes. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be an holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall uh, ye make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. Lengthy text. Thank you for sharing. Let me give you a title, and we're going to pray. The very simple thought is this. The anointing makes the difference. It doesn't make a difference. It makes the difference. Who believes that the anointing makes the difference tonight? Jesus, anoint our ears to hear, stir our heart. God, let us not be caught up in going through the motions tonight, but let our hearts be stirred. Let that worship that was in this place bring about an atmosphere of connectivity to your spirit that demonstration shall follow your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. amen. Come on, give your neighbor a fist bump and say, I'm glad you made it on a Sunday night. You ain't got no neighbors. You need to find you some neighbors. I think it bears repeating this mixture that was ordained of God to create an anointed presence. In context, this is where God had directed the building of the articles of the tabernacle and that the children of Israel would approach from the outer court and they would have an article, a uh, washing place. And then 
you, you, you got to have an altar, you got to have a washing place, and then you get into the holy place, and then you've got a candlestick, and you've got a table of showbread, and then you've got an altar of incense, and then the most holy place, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. Listen to what I read, and that is the description of the man-made articles. Write that down. Everything that I read was constructed by men's hands. Yes, God chose out men. God gave specifications and blueprints, but it was men who built them. But what took them from being just articles of man's hands to holy vessels was the anointing. Uh, I'm going to blow hot or blow cold tonight, so just get with me. It was obedience to putting these particular precious spices together in the solvent of the olive oil. And when it was mixed correctly, it says after the arts of the apothecary, uh, did your grandmother cook like my grandmother? She didn't really have a recipe. She'd throw a little of this and a little of that and mix it. And if it looked right, and if it was the right color or the right texture, it was good. Everybody say amen. But do you want to take your blood pressure medicine from a pharmacist who throws a pinch of this in and a pinch of that in, and it looks about right? Try it. You'll be fine. That description, Brother Alford, of the art of the apothecary was to follow strict guidelines. Not just of cleanliness, but accountability of contents. I worked as a pharmacy technician and worked my way up to mixing uh, IVs. And it was clear liquids and clear liquids. And you know what? When in doubt, throw it out. If you thought you might have put the wrong thing in there, you, did, you couldn't see two clear liquids. So you had to throw it away. Don't, don't, don't doubt it. Don't, don't put somebody in harm's way if you're not sure. The way that you got advancement as a pharmacy or a... Uh, IV technician was you developed a relationship with the pharmacist and when they knew you could be trusted not to be perfect but to be honest I feel the Holy Ghost you were showing them what you put in it but they couldn't tell they had to trust you because you were putting clear liquids and clear liquids that could kill somebody but over time not that you'd got every mixture right but when you made a mistake you were honest and you took your own mistake and said hey I made a mistake let's throw this away and when you demonstrated an honest heart then they developed trust it when you said this is what's in there that's what's in there God is looking for some people that understand it's not about being perfect. It's about being honest before him. He knows who you are. It's when you can get honest with who you are. You're a man with limitations. You will make mistakes. You are not perfect. But when you ask God to make up the difference... It is the anointing. And he was using an example. Can you be trusted to mix it just like I say mix it? But how many times do we want to cut a corner? How many times do we want to manufacture the blessings of God instead of going back to the word of the Lord and having that apothecary mindset? If the Lord says don't do it, I'm not going to do it. If the Lord says do it and do it this way, we better have a made up mind. If I don't like it or nobody else thinks it's good or beneficial, I'm going to obey down to the jot and tittle what the word of the Lord says. Now here's what I want you to get. You may think the concept of anointing is out of date and say, well, you know, that's an old Bible, Old Testament thing. But the scripture records right here in 32. He says, and you should do this from generation to generation. There should never be a generation that doesn't understand the important, importance of the anointing. We must know that the anointing makes the difference. Who knows that you can hear singing, but then the hair on the back of your neck will stand up when the anointed sings. 
I'm talking to somebody. You can hear motivational speakers. You can hear preachers. But there's a difference between preaching and anointed preaching. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. There's a difference between worship services and anointed worship services. I hear it over and over again. People come from other places, and I'm not casting dispersions on other places, and I'm not saying we're perfect, but I couldn't count the number of times that people will walk in that door, and they barely get to their seat, and we're not even in our first song. I love you, Sister Beth. It's not just you. And saints, it's not just you. There is an abiding presence of God when His people call on His name and declare that He is the only holy and true God. When you begin to lift Him up, I'm talking about anointed worship. It's a difference. People can tell it. Because the anointing makes the difference. So, Pastor, you're back in the Old Testament It doesn't relate for us. My Bible says in 1 John 2 and 20, ye are given an unction. If you look that word unction up, it's transliterated unction, but it also is the same word where we get anointing. Ye are given an anointing. Let me me say it again. You are given an anointing. The word anointing literally means to smear or to rub. I can't speak for you. I've had some grease smeared on me anybody and you try to rub it off anybody try to rub it off before you shake somebody's hands but it's down in the grains of your flesh it almost dies your skin can I say there's something about the anointing that gets down in us it's not a superficial thing it's not something you can just take a rag and wipe off it has staying power it'll For the psalm of David in Psalms 133 talks about how good and how precious it is for for brethren to dwell in the spirit of unity. But the beautiful type and shadow of what he sees unity as is just like when the anointing oil was poured on, on Aaron's head and it flowed and it came down his beard and it came down his garments and it gathered in the hem of his garment. I'm saying this six Quarts of oil. You're not going to rub that off with a rag. Can, can I say this? We don't need a touch of the anointing. We need to be immersed in the anointing, abiding presence of God. My Bible says in Joel, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. The world has got more issues today than it's ever had. Could it be that God prophesied in the last days, I'm going to pour out the whole six courts. I'm going to let go of everything I've been holding back because the anointing is what breaks the yoke. The anointing is what's going to deliver the world. I'm not... I'm not saying a little praying and folding of hands is going to save it. I'm talking about anointed preaching is going to reach our city. Anointed preaching and worship is going to save our families. The anointing is what's going to bring. He says, in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be proud, blasphemers, disobedient, apparent, unholy, unthankful, without natural affection. But the same God looks at the same last days. But in the last days, I'm going to meet the need of the sinner. I'm going to break the devil's back. I'm going to overcome all the vile affections of the world. And it's not going to be some charismatic preacher. It's going to be the anointing. It's the vessel of God that allows his spirit to move through them in the hands of righteousness. I don't think you're getting, I'm out of my notes Does the book of Romans says, Paul says, I I would that I could come to you, but I was led hither to in chapter 1. But then he goes on to say, I was led hither to, but thanks be to God that there were men that preached the word of God with unholy and unthankful hands. But the word still worked, even though the servant, even though the preacher wasn't what he's supposed to be, the anointing. 
I, I don't think you're getting it. You keep looking for a perfect preacher and you're on an endless journey. I'm not looking for a perfect man for there's only one perfect man. His name was Jesus. But the anointing is what I'm looking for. The manifest presence of God. He tells them, take that six quarts of olive oil. See, that's the same thing that brought light in the most holy place. That was what was in the golden candlestick, but it had something added to it. I want you to take precious, costly spices. Don't have time to break down those five things tonight. They have great significance. I don't have time for that tonight. I value your time. Your time is important to me, but I do want you to get this point. Every one of those spices, cinnamon, calmus, cassia, myrrh, Every one of those spices to be effective in this ointment of anointing had to be crushed and broken. And if you think you're going to have the anointing without having some brokenness, some grinding and crushing, many times God wants to give us the anointing, but as soon as the discomfort starts, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. This must not be the will of God because I'm not enjoying it a whole lot. Can I tell you where the real anointing is born? It's not through joy. It's not through happiness. It is through sorrow that only God can sustain and fulfill in your life it's when you put yourself back on the potter's wheel and he applies the pressure and he gets out the stuff and he does a complete work in your stay with me the anointing comes out of brokenness now who in here has been given any gifts or talents i'm looking for that spiritual gift of eating that's I'm praying the Lord sends that one. I mean, he's going to qualify. I'm already doing it, but, you know, I'm waiting on it, okay? You are given by God gifts and talents. Can, can I pick on somebody for just a second? Thank, thank you. for who, who loves Sister Stephanie Alford? Amen. Love Sister Stephanie. She, she is so faithful on Sunday mornings to work with your kids. She just got a great spirit, hard worker. I love her. And there's some man who's missing out because you're awesome. If you find one, you let me know. We'll get him. I got batteries in my stun gun. We'll get him. And she said, Pastor, I want to come up here and do a little artwork, a little painting. My Lord, this girl's got so much talent. She started taking little scrap brushes and stuff. Whoosh. She's painting this most beautiful little artwork mural in the nursery. And so I'm like, man, that's disgusting. I just can't stand you, I, you know. And that's just one of many talents. Every one of us has been given talents, musical talents, artistic talents, the talents of communication, uh, talents of illustration, the talent of faithfulness. That you're here, you're always here. That consistency is a gift from God. But the anointing has the ability to bring the best out of you. <clears throat> now, I want you to get that. How important is the anointing? The anointing takes a simple piece of art and makes it a masterpiece. The anointing of God takes a simple message and makes it a powerful, dynamic, life-changing message. The anointing takes just an ordinary song with three chords and maybe one minor, two verses, and one chorus and turns it into a song that a whole generation sings and identifies and it brings back a connection with God. What is the common denominator? It's not the words. It's not the writer. It's not the musicians. It's not where it's recorded. It is the anointing that makes the difference. Psalms 92 and 10 says, Pour out fresh oil for the anointing. Not stale oil, but fresh oil. Now, I know when chicken's bad, it gives you all kinds of warning signs. 
when chickens sing. But can you look at a bottle of Crisco and say it's bad? <clears throat> but I think God is going to do his miraculous work. And at the marriage supper of the Lamb, he's going to take all the carbs out of potatoes. Or he's going to make carbs of none effect. Okay. Who believes that? Who believes that? I, I don't think I'm Irish, but I love their potatoes. I love, you can't mess up hardly a potato, especially pan fried potatoes. And I was trying to help get supper on the table one night. Julie wasn't home from work yet. And I said, I'm going to surprise her. I'm going to do some pan fried potatoes. Come on, somebody. With some diced up onions. Mm. And I had some. Slow cooked pinto beans with a ham bone. Come on, somebody. Now, I can't make homemade cornbread. I had some jiffy bread. She had to make that. I don't have the patience to make the bread. But we, we was going to eat good. Going to eat good. And I, I said, I better sample those potatoes before she gets home to make sure they're fit to eat. <clears throat> Knowing they, you can't hardly mess a potato up. I just wanted to satisfy my own curiosity. And I bit into them. I know the potatoes weren't bad because potatoes will let you know when they're bad. They'll let you know. You don't have to pray. You don't have to discern. They just B-A-D, stink, get them out of here. But I couldn't tell. But I finally deduced that the bottle of Crisco I used to fry those potatoes had been nigh a long time in that condition. And I peeled some more potatoes and found the new bottle of oil, and they turned out just fine. Do you understand that stale oil affects the taste? Ecclesiastes says that stale oil attracts flies. It's talking about an oil-based perfume. That, that stench of the oil attracts those flies. Who, who's ever heard of fly in the ointment? That word ointments where we get the word perfume. That flies are attracted to that spoiled oil. And the word said, so does the folly taint the honor and wisdom of an elder. Can I stop and preach here just a minute? I eat, if you miss the anointing and get out of the perfect will of God, I don't care how many times you've got it right. And should be represented in glory and honor when we get out from under the anointing. We can mess our lives up. We can mess other people's lives up. When we get out of the anointing, when we're living on yesterday's experience or what happened 20 years ago, our oil is still. It takes fresh oil to have the anointing that brings healing. I am by myself in here. I'm not mad, but I, I, don't, I want some participation in this deal. Here we go. So we have another service. We know what to do. We stand when we're supposed to stand. We clap because others are clapping. We sit down because we don't want to be the only one standing. You like that 4-4 time in that song. You like those lyrics and you, you get just a little more exuberant. But it's just another service and it's the old smell of religion and the machine of a worship service carries its own momentum. But without the anointing, without the fresh Oil. Do you know how you get fresh oil? It's what's been pressed today. I don't care what you were reading a year ago. I meet with other preachers and I say, how you doing and what's going on? And they're telling me the same things they told me six months ago when I saw them. I don't want to know what God was doing in your life six months ago. It's what he's doing today. It's I've been in the altar. I've been in the book. I have heard from God. This is my testimony. Six months ago, God was doing this. But today, he's moving in this way. I'm excited. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to have a form of godless. I want the anointing, the fresh oil of God working in our lives. Fresh oil. You remember that woman with the alabaster box? You understand what made that so significant? Number one, that was her dowry. 
when she broke that box, she said, I'm sacrificing my future hope of freedom because she could not be a landowner. She could not own great possessions. She said, I am given my future. It's a gypsum container. You know what gypsum is? Look at that wall. That's gypsum board, drywalls made out of gypsum. And it's almost a combination between clay and silica sand. Don't matter. But if you water it right and compress it right, it'll have somewhere between a stone and a shell. It's very brittle and very fragile. But it had big pores in it. And so they would put perfume or oils for anointing in them. And just kind of like those air fresheners, y'all got those little glass air fresheners that you plug in, and they emit this little oily, fresh air, Bahama breezes or coconut colada. You better stay away from that colada stuff. And it gives a beautiful fragrance to your house, and it lingers a long time. See, this woman had that in her home, and when she would smell that fragrance, oh, there's coming a day, I'm going to have a husband, and he's going to be my provider, and he's going to carry me away, and he's going to provide for me. And when she came to Jesus, she broke it. It was irretrievable. When she gave it, that oil couldn't be put back in the container. She wasn't going to give it and take it back. If you want to have the anointing, God is not looking for you to jar it up for yourself. He is looking for you to be broken that you can pour it out, that his house could have a sweet aroma of his goodness and his mercy. Here's what I'm saying. That woman broke that box, and the disciples could smell the odor, for it filled all the house. Can I tell you what? Anointing will affect the atmosphere. We can be having a dead, dry, boring service, and an anointed song can go forth, and the same people that were saying, I wish they'd be quiet so I could check my Facebook status real quick. And all of a sudden, the anointing will begin to move, and people who had not been engaged with the worship service, all of a sudden, say, whoa, I felt something. Whoa, something going on here. Oh, I got to put this down. Oh, I got to get connected. God is coming through. What's going on? I heard that, whoa, and somebody's getting touched. I need to check it out. I need to get a part of what God is doing. It changes the atmosphere in the room. An anointed song, an anointed word, an anointed worshiper, the odor of anointing. Psalm 72 says the anointing smells like fresh cut grass after the rain. I didn't have to paint you a picture. I bet every one of you started going, y'all still remember that summer day? I saw it right there. So you, you can smell it. You got a memory bank of odors. You know when you go into somebody's house, ooh, it smells like my grandmother's in here. How do you know? Because your brain categorizes scents and odors it is one of the strongest cognitive abilities to bring back memories is smell God knew what he was talking about for he said the anointing has an odor that is an aroma that fills a general area it is like fresh cut grass after the rain you can smell the rose of Sharon oh you can smell the lily of the valley remember Aaron was anointed with six quarts of oil I wish I had a willing participant tonight. I've got a box of some oil back here. And nobody if I had a hundred dollar bill, everybody would be running up here. Six quarts of oil, not so much. Six quarts of oil. Can you imagine after Aaron was anointed high priest and he tried to walk home? Talking about a bad hair day. Woo. In his long beard running down his hands. It's in the hem. I don't think it stayed just in the hem. I, I think it got in his sandals. You know that gush? Go, anybody know that gush? Them leather sandals were slipping and a sliding. It affected how he walked. Why is it in the summertime we're hot and we get sprayed off with a garden hose, but we walk in the house? People don't run when they're wet, do they? They get wet and they come in the house going. And that air condition hits that cold, wet shirt on your back. And you can't run because you're going to dribble slower if you run. What is it about us? I don't think Aaron was running home. I think Aaron was walking in the anointing. Can you imagine as he walked among the tents and the 
dwellings throughout the community going to his house. And somebody says, whoo, what is that smell? Some boy looks out the flap and says, it's the man of God. Can I tell you, we need to have the anointing when we walk by somebody. We're not just somebody. Have you ever had somebody say, hey, co-worker, hey, neighbor, can I ask you, it's not your hair, it's not your clothes, it's not your car, it's not even your vocabulary. There is something different about you. Can you tell me what the difference about you versus our other neighbor or our other? I can tell you what the difference is. It is the anointing. It is the anointing of God that people can distinguish and identify. I'm telling you, you ever heard of the Happy Goodman family? I'm so old. Nobody's going to say, I don't know who the Happy Goodman family is. Happy Goodman family. Wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Which we rewrote it. Wouldn't take nothing for my Jersey cow. Spiritual. Spiritual. And Rusty Goodman's daughter got married to their piano player, Michael Sykes. And Michael and Tanya and I uh, had become acquaintances. And Tanya was our banker for a good while. Sweet, precious person. And I'm sitting in her office doing some church business one day. And we're just talking about Southern Gospel or singing groups and stuff. And I said, man... I heard such and such group, man, they were awesome. Her exact words. She said, oh, Brother Sadler, let me tell you. You give me one of them UPC girls. She said, they'll send us all these demo tapes, and that's okay, that's okay. She said, one of them apostolic Pentecostal girls will send us a tape, and I can hear it. And she said, honey, I can pick it out. There is something different. There's something unique. There is an anointing. Do you know why? When we make up in our mind that we're not going to be like everybody else, we've made up our mind we're going to be separate. Verse 32 of chapter 30 here tells us that don't pour it on flesh. Romans chapter 8 says those who mind the things of the flesh will not come to anything for it's those who have their mind on the spirit that are going to have a great result. Galatians 3 and 3. How can you beginning in the spirit now operate in the flesh and think you're going to... What you talking about, preacher? I'm telling you about what makes the difference. It's not your carnal wisdom. It's not your physical ability. It's not how smart or how good you are. It is the anointing of God that rests on you when you make, when you make up your mind, I got to have the anointing of God on my life. 1 Samuel 16. Thank you, Brother Mario. 1 Samuel 16. One of the few, if not only times, where we see God rebuke Samuel. Do you follow the life of Samuel? Do you realize that he anointed Saul king of Israel and he is preparing to die, to pass off the face of the earth? Do you realize he's still alive 20 years later? Don't have time to preach that tonight. And he has to anoint another king. Do you remember he was resentful in the beginning? God, they've rejected me. And God says, no, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. They've rejected me. You don't worry about it. I know what I'm doing. You just keep doing what I've called you to do, and I'll deal with them. And guess what the word says? 20 years later, the same Samuel that resented a king being anointed, God has to tell him, quit mourning for Saul. The same guy that you resented and resisted 20 years ago, now you're mourning for him. He says, get up, get the oil, and we're going to anoint another king. Let me stop preaching. And some of us have hitched our wagon to a personality or a ministry, and the kingdom of God is bigger than any one man or any one ministry. I'm not looking for the sign or the name over the door. I'm looking for the presence of the Lord. I'm looking for the anointing. A man is still just a man, but without the anointing, he's not worth anything. He says, get up, get the oil, and we're going to anoint another king. So Samuel got off his pity party and went. And Eliab, the oldest brother of the sons of Jesse came into the house for God directed Samuel to go to the house of Jesse. 
And the word of the Lord says, now this is Sadler's interpretation, but I think it'll bear out. He looked at him and his outward appearance, whoo, man, he's just presidential. He, he's got the look. He's got the square chin, <clears throat> got the dark hair parted just so, big muscles, beautiful white teeth, great diction. Oh, this is king material right here. Do you remember what God tells Samuel? says, hey, wait, 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 wait. Man looketh on the outward. But God looks on the, he says, I'm not going to anoint this. I don't care how good they look. I don't care how much potential they have. I don't care how good they think they are. It is a matter of the heart before God rests his anointing. You can have perfected all manner of outward appearance, but if you have not allowed God to penetrate your heart, don't tell me how holy you are by where you go and don't go show me how holy you are by how you think about your brother and your sister. How can you love God who you have not seen when you hate your brother that you have seen? Here's what I want you to get. He said, I ain't anointing that. Samuel's out of boys. He said, Jesse, you got any boys? Yeah, I got this one kid, but we're not sure if he's going to make it. He's a little off in the head. What do you mean? He's out in the field tending the sheep, and he's worshiping like nobody's watching. Do you know who God's looking to anoint? He's looking for somebody that will be faithful in their duties and worship him no matter who's watching or not watching. I, I'm glad you can speak well when you're in the house of the Lord, but how do you treat your waiter or waitress? How do you speak to your neighbor? How do you treat your kid? God wants to anoint somebody. He's like, I ain't going to anoint that. I'm looking for somebody who understands it's from the heart that we have to connect with God and allow him to work in us. Now, remember what David's writing. He's writing the Psalms. That's what the Word says. He's writing the Psalms. Can you play along for just a minute? If you all have that ability, can you play along? I can see Samuel saying, you got any more boys? Well, we got that crazy eighth son of Jesse out there. David of no good report. And he's out there worshiping like nobody's watching and tending the sheep. Son, go out there and get your brother. <clears throat> And right before the brother comes and gets him, David's thinking, ooh, I got a song. Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come in. Thou anointest my head with oil. David, daddy wants you. Why? The prophet is here to anoint somebody king of Israel. Could it be that David had understood the anointing when he was just tending sheep. For he gave his wrist his life for the protection of the sheep. I don't know about you. I think God wants to anoint some people that are more interested in protecting the sheep than they are building a name or a ministry for themselves. Now, can you all play along for just a second? Can you pretend you're enjoying this? Now, my brother and I, knew what it was to have slingshots. Now, we had some of those cheap wooden ones that was just a piece of wood with a, with a Y. The problem with those, if you got off a line, it could bounce off one of those side props and bounce back and hit you in the face. I didn't like them too good. But we, they came out with these metal ones that had a brace that went across your arm and, and the Y was very broad, and it used surgical tubing and had a little leather pocket or pouch, and you could <clears throat> put a marble. I don't recommend it, but you could put a ball bearing. It's a wonder we still have eyes to see with today. Do, do you all remember those bagworm bushes, you know, those big uh, furry trees that had these little little brown sacks that had little green worms growing them. Those also produced these little, they looked like rubber comets, little balls that grew on them. We called them rubber comet trees is what we call. I didn't know what they were. You know, we go collect those. Those go really good in a slingshot. 
I mean, it, it'll put a bruise, but it won't take out an eye. It's just a good weapon. My dad had an old work belt, Sister Angie. It had a little pouch, you know, for like roofing tacks and things in it. I started wearing that thing, but I kept it full of those little green balls. What? David, can I ask you a question? What do you think he defended the sheep with? Now, we think of surgical tubing, or we think of rubber band on this little wooden stick. Not so. The slingshot at that time period was often a piece of fabric, could be a piece of leather, and it was just a long piece, and they would get it balanced, and in the bottom, they'd place that rock, and they'd get centripetal force, and they'd let go of one side, and you had to get really good. You had to let it go just right, one side, to swing open, pow, to be accurate. Now, I could preach a lot of things, but while Samuel's at the house with the oil to anoint the next king, could David have been out in the field? Well, when I get anointed, then I'm going to start doing something. Do you want to know who God's going to pour his anointing on? That those who are doing their best where they're at. I've had young men think, well, I'm waiting to be elected pastor somewhere. You don't wait till you get elected to find the anointing. You become an anointed janitor. You become an anointed door knocker. You become an anointed Sunday school teacher. You become an anointed Bible study teacher. I'm telling you, you keep doing it. Could David be out there praying, thank you, Lord, for this slingshot? And I believe one of these days you're going to use this talent. Long before he ever slew Goliath, David was learning how to tap into his talents. And when the anointing met his talent, it brought deliverance for Israel. I'm talking about the anointing makes the difference. Have I got five more minutes? Three more minutes? Because the anointing makes the difference. Say it this way. Do you remember when David, already anointed king, but his dad sends him to go take bread and cheese, grapes and provisions to his brothers that have been sitting there watching Goliath defame the name of the Lord. Is there not a cause? This is terrible. This is awful. How can y'all sit here like a bunch of cowards? Saul was okay with it. Do you know why? Because Saul had lost the anointing. Can I tell you something? When you get comfortable with sin, when you get okay with not praying and not reading your Bible, when you're comfortable with, well, alternative lifestyles are just as legitimate as our lifestyle, and there's many versions of the Scripture, there's many ways to God, and you can come as you are and stay as you are. When you get okay with sin, You better check yourself. You may have lost the anointing. The anointing of God makes the difference. He says, hey, son, you're willing to go out there. We're going to let you be fodder for for his cannon. We're going to let him take you out, and we're going to sit here and watch you be squashed like a bug. But, hey, would you like to take my armor? You know what David said? He said, no, I know. I've proven. You know what he's really saying? I have felt the anointing with this weapon. Can I tell you what? You may need a lot of money. You may want a career or a position. You may want everybody to brag on you. You might want to be a pastor of a big church. You might want to be a surgeon. You might want to be an accountant. And those things are admirable and they're good. But let me tell you something. I wouldn't trade nothing for the anointing of God. I'm speaking from the pastoral position. You could give me a bigger church, but if I had to check the anointing at the door, no thank you. I would love to have great bus ministry and bigger building and already have our sprinkler system in. Somebody pray, Jesus, amen. And I'd love to have expansion in so many areas, but if we get all that and we lose the anointing, we're going to miss it. For the anointing is what makes the difference. The town of Smyrna doesn't need another church that's having fellowship service. Smyrna needs an apostolic on fire, spirit-filled, Bible-believing, God-loving, worshiping church that can't live without the anointing operating in our services. The scripture says, I'm almost through the whole chapter, so you're, you're safe. I only have 11 more pages. I can do that in Some minutes. I don't want to commit myself. 
I'm almost there. The word says, and you shall not pour it on a stranger. That, that loses something in the modern English. The word stranger meant those that are not set apart. Do you know that in every part of life, purity yields power? Let me say that again. Purity <clears throat> yields power. Anybody here love ethanol? But Dallas is grinning. I got his attention. Anybody like that? It's 90% gasoline and 10% corn juice. What, what does ethanol do to a weed eater? Anybody know? I wish Brother Kenny was here. He would tell you. You know that inferior, not all gasoline, it's not pure gasoline. It's been substituted part of it. All those rubber lines and gaskets that are in your little small engines, it'll eat up every gasket and ring. It'll start leaking. It, those supply lines will start leaking. It'll eat up. If you've got a plastic carburetor, it'll eat it up. Over time, it'll damage and destroy it. <clears throat> let, me ask, let me ask you another question here. Who likes m to buy sugar and get mostly sugar? It's sugar and some other stuff. <clears throat> Who likes mostly sugar? Okay. When I buy sugar, what do I want? I want pure sugar. Anybody here ha hate to clean? When I get down to business cleaning, I want something that's going to cut, right? And they sell these cleaners that if you read the label, we have already diluted it for you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now... It doesn't work anymore. <clears throat> Sell me the pure chemical and I can reduce it with water myself to the desired result. But now that you've diluted it, it don't work. Okay? I used to try to save a some money and I would buy hydrogen peroxide from Dollar General. Read the label. It's not the same strength or concentration that you buy at Walgreens. Look at it. The percentage of peroxide, it's been reduced, and it's not near as effective for what you need it for. Now, Pastor, what does that have to do with the anointing? Purity yields power. When we are less pure, the anointing becomes diluted in our lives, and it's minimally effective. If you want the anointing to have its maximum effect, it only operates best in a pure, sanctified vessel. I, I know when I use the word sanctified, people start gagging. People are so last decade, last generation, last life, Sanctification is an old term. It doesn't relate to us. I am telling you, unless you have set yourself apart for the work of the Lord, you are not going to experience any significant power of the anointing. If you're not separate, set apart, and different from the world, how are you going to make a difference? Okay, okay. I'm dealing with people, so i got, I got to use people examples. You ready? I, I got two addictions. Well, I'm doing good on one. Uh, uh, coffee, I, I, I hadn't had any coffee today, I don't think. Isn't that a miracle? Isn't God good? Today I was going, wow. Cut that from the live stream, please. And, and really, God has helped me. I, I used to drink, you know, two or three pots of coffee a day. And then I got down to two or three cups a day. And then now I might have a cup a day. I might not have a cup. And God, good. Yeah. yeah. And my other, uh, I give myself permission. I don't have a lot of hobbies. And so for about 12 weeks in the fall, I, I kind of follow college football. And when it's over, it's over. Okay. But I, I kind of I kind of enjoy that. And so uh, the University of Alabama uh, had an offensive coordinator. And we noticed, we tried to spot him on the sidelines. And guess what? <clears throat> He was wearing the same shirt all the players are wearing. <clears throat> and so the players are on the field trying to get the offensive play called into the game. And they're all looking, and they can't find the guy calling the plays because he looks like everybody else on the sidelines. 
And apparently they told the head coach at halftime, and he went and found him a shirt. Everybody on the team was wearing red jerseys with white letters. He got him the darkest gray. I mean, it was it was September in Alabama. He had him in a long sleeve, dark gray hoodie. He wanted to make sure nobody had a hard time knowing what the play was. And you, it didn't take 37 microseconds. You look down that 200 people on the sidelines. Oh, there he is right there. He's got that gray hoodie. He's got sweat beads on his forehead. He may pass out with a heat stroke any minute. Pastor, you've lost your mind. No, I'm making good sense. If we look just like the world and we talk just like the world and we act just like the world and when the world's looking for directions of how to have their life change and how to get out of the mess and the stupid thing, if we're, there's no difference in us, how are they going to know where to look? The anointing operates in purified committed, sanctified vessels. Nadab and Abihu, the Bible says, offered strange fire. Do you know what that's really saying? They were trying to do a job they were not anointed to do. Saul was cut off as king over Israel, not because he wasn't able to be king. It was because he tried to do the high priest job. He tried to do something he didn't have the anointing to do. That's why the word here says, anybody here who tries to substitute Either the ingredients or its operation will suffer a great penalty. It can affect your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. I love my mother. I think of her so much more this time of year because it's baking season. She used to make the best carrot cake. Somebody said, does anybody really eat carrot cake? Sign me up. If you need a taste tester, I'm your guy. Okay. Love carrot cake. She'd make a great carrot cake. But at Christmas time, Sister Angie, she'd make these, they're called pecan fingers. It's like a shortbread type cookie. And you kind of do them like little long, and they look kind of like fingers. And Sister Brenda, when they'd come out of the oven on that cookie sheet, that, that little bit of oil would come out of that cookie. And you would roll that in confection sugar, and that little bit of oil would cause that confection sugar to stick. Doesn't that just sound good? Come on. Had pecans in it. Oh, come on. That's good. It's good. And one year, my mother got excited in a hurry and baking seven things at the same time. And she made a batch of them, and the confection sugar wouldn't stick, and they wasn't right. And she said, oh, I think my flour was old. So she threw the flour out, and she got new flour. And she made a second batch, and they were no good either. And so finally, she went back to the book. The Betty Crocker cookbook. Come on, somebody. She got reading it. She went, oh, I know what I did wrong. What would you do wrong? Because moms don't make mistakes. Bacon, do they? She said, I thought I would make it better by using butter. But it says right here, you got to use margarine. So you know this. Margarine has oil in it, and it needed that oil to come through the skin of the cookie so the confection sugar would stick. And it said right there at the bottom in big, bold black letters, it says, no substitute. Can I just say, if you are living life in such a way and it ain't tasting right and acting right <clears throat> and it's not going along with you, could it be that you have substituted something for the anointing? As you stand tonight, some of you are thinking, man, you keep preaching this long. We're not coming back on Sunday night. I have only been preaching 40, 43 minutes. By the way, the average college football game is three hours and 13 minutes. Your soap opera is longer than this. And your soap opera can't save your soul. Your soap opera can't turn your next generation to God. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles, there arose a king who backslid. Guess what happened when the king backslides? All the people backslid. God had blessed them through the ages of David to make 300 shields of gold. Golden shields. Arrows couldn't penetrate them. Thick, hard, dense Shields of gold. They had to go out to battle. 
and they got looking in the house of the Lord where they had stored the gold shields, and they had been stolen. So the king says, hey, go out and get some brass ones. Brass is not near as good. He said, but polish them really good, and in, in the sun, from a distance, you won't be able to tell the difference. And after you polish them, put soldiers out in front where the people can't get too close. He was afraid that if they didn't have gold shields out in front of them, that would stop every arrow that they wouldn't go out in battle. He was willing to send the people out with less than what they needed. Can, can I tell you something? There is no substitute for what God has provided And people, I don't care how polished they are, and I don't care how well put together they are, without the anointing. Everybody say, without the anointing. This is what I'm closing with. Who knows I'm from Alabama? Who knows when I was a kid, the biggest city in Alabama was Birmingham. Now the biggest city in Alabama is my hometown. Birmingham had got to be pretty rough, Brother Alford, pretty rough. A guy named Robert Culpepper pastored a Pentecostal church in Birmingham in the mid-80s. After service, his daughter, 14, and a good friend of hers who was 16, had just got her license. And she said, Daddy, can we go up here to Sonic and get some ice cream? And she'll bring me home in just a little bit. She says, okay, go ahead. And the 16-year-old friend's her car broke down, and here is two teenage girls on the side of the road in Birmingham, Alabama, late at night. Some guy come by and offered help, and within just a couple of minutes, he had abducted those two girls, put the pastor's 14-year-old daughter in the back seat, the 16-year-old girl in the front seat beside him, used profanity, I'm going to do to you girls, and all manner of evil, and the pastor's daughter looked in the floorboard of the back seat and saw a box and in that box was ropes, tape, and a butcher knife. She told her dad later, she says, and when I saw that, I just began to cry out to God. She said, in that back seat, I just felt the anointing come over me. She said, I just began to pray in the Spirit and the Lord just began to 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 speak in me and through me and I just began to worship him right in that back seat of that guy's car who was meant no good for us. He looked at the six years and said, what's wrong with her? She's praying in the spirit. Well, make her stop. I can't make her stop. And the 16-year-old began to feel the spirit move in that car and she began to magnify the Lord. Brother Culpepper told that group of ministers, said, I'm so thankful for the anointing Because of that anointing in that car, would you believe that guy with bad intent pulled over and forced them girls to get out of the car? I I don't think you're getting what I'm... I'm telling you, the anointing, the Spirit of God resting on us and moving through us can make all the difference. I'm asking you today, if you've never felt secure about the anointing of God, you've never felt that unction. (laughs) You're facing situations... You're on the edge of transition. You're about to step out into a move of faith. You've got decisions to make and you're not sure what to do. I'm going to ask you, Sister Beth, please tonight, I want you to step out and come and speak to the Lord and inquire of Him and ask for His anointing and that He would give you an unction. God can cause you to go into court and be a victor. God can cause you the doctor and get a good report. God, through the anointing, can overcome every adversity in your mind or in your heart. Would you come tonight and allow the anointing to move in you? And overtake us, you're the one.